Oh, I, I place him as one of the premier theoretical physicists, probably of all time. He's, he's up there, he's with Gell-Mann, he's with Feynman, he's with Hawking. He's incredible. Um, I think there's a whole generation of us uh, physicists working today for whom Weinberg is is just well, you know, just just a legend, just just the the absolute legend. I know of um, a few guys I know who, who talked about you know whenever whenever they would literally bow to Weinberg if they heard him speak, right? So this is this is a guy who isn't just a Nobel laureate; he's a Nobel laureate, a absolute legend of physics. He was the one we looked up to. His work, which led to the standard model of particle physics, has stood the test of time. One of the problems we have at the Large Hadron Collider is we can't see deviations from what he predicted. <laughs> it's just so, so superb and, and, and so robust. In, in terms of impact of what he's achieved, in terms of you know, impact on, on advancing physics, but also his textbooks and, and, and those sorts of things that, that have taught us all how to understand physics. I mean, any physics I actually would claim to understand and that might be quite limited, I would say that would be thanks to Weinberg and, and actually following his message and, and, and what he taught us about physics. Absolute legend. He wrote a paper called The Model of the Leptons. You know, leptons are particles like the electron. It's a two and a half page paper. <laughs> and he, in it, he, he unified the force of electromagnetism and the weak force. We think of four forces of nature really, right? We think of gravity. We think of the strong force which binds the nucleus together. We know of the weak force, which, you know, why the sun burns, why we're alive. And we know of electromagnetism. And one of the goals of theoretical physics, and actually Weinberg was the premier person in pushing for this goal, this reductionist idea was, maybe these four forces, as you go to higher and higher energies, can be described by a more unified approach. Maybe there's an underlying mathematical description which gives you all of them, and they only begin to manifest themselves as the universe cools down and expands. And we, we know of an example, right? Electromagnetism. We know that we have electricity and we have magnetism. We know that if we push a bar magnet through a coil of wire, it will produce a current. So the magnetic field is affecting the electric field. We know that if we change the electric field, we'll produce a magnetic field. And Maxwell showed actually that we could think of them as the same effectively. And what Weinberg did in this amazing paper, uh, then uh, independently was done by Salam and by Glashow, was he demonstrated that you could unify the weak force, the weak interactions, with electromagnetism. Now, people have been trying to do this, this previously. And in particular, you know, people like Sheldon Glashow, who was actually, actually a high school a friend of, of, of Weinberg, they went to the same school, they both won Nobel Prizes and they went to the same school, how mad is that? And they won it the same year as well. Okay. Glashow had realized that, you know, if you, if you want to, you've got electromagnetism, you've got the weak force, the electro, electromagnetism contained the photon, the weak force believed to contain these W bosons, uh, one which, which was positively charged, one which was negatively charged. What, he wanted to bring them all together and he realized that, that that just didn't seem to balance. There needed to be another a neutral sort of, something like the photon, but another one, something else, which was the Z boson, which was associated with the weak force. So there were these things, there were these, all these force carriers, these four force carriers, and they had to be put together in a consistent theory. Now, why did people believe they should be put together was, was because you know, electromagnetism and weak force, they seem to be dancing in the same ballroom in some respects. You know, you have, you have sort of, for example, the electromagnetic force, which is moving charges around, and the weak force, which is somehow changing electric, electric charges. You can have processes that involve the weak force where, where the electric charge changes, changes. So it seemed like they were all dancing in the same ballroom, and it sort of, it was natural to try to bring it together. Glashow said, well, this is probably what you need. You probably need this photon going along with these two W bosons, which are charged, but there should also be, be this, this Z boson, which should be neutral. But he couldn't quite figure out how to put it all together in a consistent way. What Weinberg did was he took those papers from 1964 that uh, people had been using to, you know, the, the, we now talk about with the Higgs mechanism and all the you know, discovery of the Higgs. Weinberg took those papers and took the mechanism they had for for giving mass to, to some of these, these, these bosons. 
and incorporated it into this, the ideas of Glashow and, and, and people like that in terms of bringing these two forces together. And he created this consistent theory. And what I particularly like about it was that he wasn't actually thinking about this initially. He was thinking about the quarks. He was thinking about the strong force. And in his calculations, he was finding that he was predicting a massless particle, which was the, pi the pion was massless. But he knew the pion wasn't massless, so it wasn't working there. And it, at that time of his life, he, was, he had young children. He was out looking after them quite often because his wife was working as well. And when he was out, he was thinking about what's going on. And he realized, actually, maybe I could apply this formalism to the weak interactions and, and electromagnetism because we know the photon is massless. He had these four sort of force carriers, the photon and, and the three carriers of the weak force. He needed to make three of them heavy. And so he realized that meant that the Higgs particle that he had to introduce into the game to make them heavy had to have basically had to be able to give three degrees of freedom to the three heavy bosons. And then there would be one degree of freedom left over, which would be the Higgs that we see. And it's exactly the physics that we see. So this new theory, which was unifying the, the weak interactions and the electromagnetism, predicted the existence of what we call weak neutral currents, or the Z particle, it's called, which was the, was the initiator of an interaction between if you had an electron and a neutrino and they scatter, so in comes an electron, in comes a neutrino and they scatter, the, the mediator which allows for that scattering was, the, was this neutral current which included the Z particle. And it was a prediction in this two and a half page paper, beautiful, beautiful paper. And he didn't really believe, it, 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 he knew it was good, <laughs> but he didn't really believe that it was, he, he didn't really think it's, it, it's going to be a description of nature. And this is really interesting because he didn't know at that time whether this theory, which we call the electroweak theory, was what we call renormalizable. What does that mean? Renormalizable means that you can take all the infinities which often occur in quantum mechanics, in quantum field theory, and properly absorb them into physical quantities so that you end up with a predictive theory. If you have something that gives you an infinity and you don't know what to do with it, then how do you know how to believe any of the finite results? Renormalization is the technique which allows you to properly absorb them, that's called the regularization bit, and then make a prediction for a finite quantity. He didn't know if the theory was renormalizable. And it wasn't, and so this, this model got very little attention. If I remember right, it only had for about the first two or three years, three or four citations. It now has over 11 and a half thousand, by the way. Three or four citations. Then in 1971, Tuft and Veltman showed in their own Nobel Prize winning work that this was a, what, a renormalizable theory. You could absorb these infinities and wow, it took off. A year later, they found at, the, at CERN, they found the existence of these neutral currents. During the first experiment, 500,000 photographs were taken. And the Z particle emerged. And that's what was measured inside this chamber back in 1973. So this is a big, this is, this is a piece of history, is it? It really is a piece of history. This, this, the experiment that went on in this machine actually won uh, Glashoff, Weinberg and Salam the Nobel Prize in 1979. What happened in this? They've got a lot to thank, thank this machine for. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the way I've seen this put really nicely in the last few days, you know, sort of, and I think it's nice to put it in this context, you know, Isaac Newton sort of, he, he sort of brought together sort of terrestrial gravity and celestial gravity, you know, he brought those two together and, and merged them into one. Maxwell, you know, he brought together electricity and magnetism, made them into, into, into one unified uh, theory. And Weinberg did the same thing. He took electromagnetism in the weak theory and he combined them into one theory, which was electroweak theory. And that was Weinberg's legacy, to, to, to bring these two theories together. And you just look at the other names I've mentioned and you really see the context of, of the quality we're talking about. He also, in, in that paper, by the way, the one that, um, the two and a half page paper, he kind of introduced the Higgs. Higgs, of course, had done his work in 1966. What, what, what a time this was in the early, 64, 65, 66. So there was Higgs, there was Broughton Ongler, and there was Kibble and, and collaborators. And they'd all postulated this particle, which became known as the Higgs. But what Weinberg actually did was, Weinberg actually placed it in the context of the electroweak theory. He said, it must be here, and when it is here, it will give me these interactions. And so in some sense, the discovery of the Higgs at the, at the LHC, I think you could say is the discovery of the Weinberg Higgs that he 
postulated would, would be there. I, I would say Weinberg, what, what he had this uncanny knack of sort of unpicking the, the, the details of, of any, any given scenario in physics. You know, whether you're talking about cosmology, whether you're talking about general relativity, whether you're talking about quantum mechanics, whether you're talking about quantum field theory, whatever, any branch of physics, Weinberg had this ability just to basically almost forget what everybody else had told him about it and look at it on his terms. So he'd look at this branch of physics, let's say quantum mechanics for sake of argument, he'd look at it on his terms and then unpick it in his way. The coupling constant appears in the Lagrangian multiplying some kind of operator. And then somehow, because of his superb insight, obviously, he was able to sort of then understand it more deeply than perhaps others had. And at the same time, he was able to convey that understanding to the rest of us, you know, as much as we could understand, you know, sort of the level of Weinberg things. But, but it, you know, I, I think that's what it was. I think it was his ability just to, to stand back and say, well, I'm going to look at this on my terms. And then when he did that, you know, things just opened up for him. Ed, you, so, you sort of talk about how this famous paper was two and a half pages and this little smile comes across your face. <laughs> Why is that? What's special about the fact it was two and a half pages? I think it shows this was someone who was so in charge of what he was doing that he knew the essence of what you needed to say. He knew exactly what needed to be said and he knew exactly how to say it and the eloquence of it is like reading a beautiful novel. I mean, when, in hindsight, I think if I was reading it in the early 60s or 67, I'd have been totally flummoxed by it. But in hindsight, having, you know, you, you teach courses on it, you attend courses on it, you go to lectures on this subject, you become familiar with the terminology and what it is. To see it written as the initial kind of breakthrough paper is just staggering. And I think that's why I'm smiling at the two and a half page. And the fact, you know, I'm currently writing a 40 page paper and I think, well, what, in, what, what, what impact is that going to have on the world? <laughs> You know, you, you go through his book on, on quantum field theory and, and or, you know, or general relativity, and things are just put in, a, in, a, in such a, in a clear way. Um, and I said, I, I think he is. I think he's taught a generation um, how to think like a physicist. I, th I think that's what it is. He's taught us how to, how to think like a physicist. Now, I'm certain that many, many of us fall short. We don't, we, we're nowhere near Weinberg's level. But... But what we do right, I think we do right, most of us, thanks to the way Weinberg has taught us to think. I think he really has taught a generation of physicists how to think properly. So I started my PhD in 1982 in Newcastle, and for the first few months, anyone doing a PhD knows you're, you're scrabbling in the dark, you, you might be given a project to do, and I did it, and I'd written a paper, and, and it, that was great. I had a lovely start, and, but it wasn't what I wanted to really do. I didn't know what I really wanted to do. And then I went to this meeting at the Royal Society, which Weinberg had organized. And it was a meeting on the fundamental constants. It's, it, I think it's turned into f quite a famous meeting because I was, no, not because I was there, but. Um, but he was there. He was there. <laughs> Hawking was there. It is the meeting where, and I was at the talk where Hawking said that N equals eight supergravity is probably gonna be the theory of everything. We've just got a few things to wrap up and by the turn of the century, we'll have done it. And we're still searching for it. But Weinberg came on and gave a talk and I just sat there and I thought, wow, wow, wow. And he was talking about some work he did with a, another brilliant physicist, a mathematician really, a mathematical physicist called Philip Candelis, who's Rouse Professor of Mathematics at Oxford. They'd worked together on a theory called, called Kluze-Klein theory. That is the idea that the universe is made up of extra dimensions. And why don't we see them? Well, all the extra dimensions are, are, are in a small, in a sphere. And what, he, what they said was that the forces that we see, electromagnetism, the strong force and the weak force, are manifestations of this compact dimensions. And I thought this was so beautiful because you could have a theory here which was this extra dimensional theory which was pure gravity. But when you sort of take out your four dimensions of space time that we live in, and you reinterpret these extra dimensions, you reinterpret them as the forces of nature. And, and, and I thought, I want to do this. I, this is what I want to do. I was lucky because a, a, a guy came to Newcastle at the time called De, uh, David Toms, and he was working in this field. And so we got working together, and that was my whole PhD. And then at the end of my PhD, so my PhD is on quantum Kaluza-Klein quantum corrections in Kaluza-Klein cosmologies. Because that, of a talk by Weinberg? Yeah, co completely. Completely because of this talk. Weinberg didn't write any more papers on this, as far as I could tell. I think he had no interest. He, 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 just, he just moved on to something else. Maybe he wrote one or two more, but it wasn't... 
I looked them up the other day, I couldn't find any more. I thought, but you, you pioneered my research. And then from there, as I came to the end of my PhD, I thought, well, what, what, I'd like to do a postdoc. And I wrote to him um, and I said, would I, if I can get a fellowship, could I come to Austin, Texas, where you are and join your group? And to my amazement, he wrote, I said, yeah, sure. And it was very short. <laughs> yeah, sure. Come along. It was less than two and a half pages. It was less than two and a half pages. So I went to the, for what are known as the SCRC interviews. It's what would now you'd think of as STFC, but at the time, Science and Engineering Research Council. And I got the fellowship. And I was all geared up to go. And the pound completely crashed. The pound went from something like a dollar seventy down to a dollar. And I was being paid in pounds. And so my, my whole fellowship was worth about £10,000. I made inquiries. It would have cost me £10,000 just to rent a property. And so I was lucky I got... So instead of working with um, Weinberg, I ended up working with Kibble <laughs> because Imperial also offered me a position and I took the fellowship to Imperial where I ended up working with Tom Kibble. So it was fine. I mean, I, I, did, I, did, I did okay in the end thanks to... Thanks to uh, Imperial, but I was going to go to. I I did t I did tell Weinberg this. I told him it. I, I met him. Um, Weinberg had a lot of respect for Kibble, and uh, and when Tom Kibble, who you might remember, didn't get the Nobel Prize, <laughs> we did a video. Imperial invited Weinberg to give the main talk uh, at a birth 80th birthday celebration for Tom Kibble, and, and Weinberg came and, and he gave this staggering talk. No notes, no nothing. Just stood there for an hour. And afterwards, we went for, for dinner, and um, so I told him that story. And you know, after he'd cry, after he'd stopped crying, he was okay about it. He <laughs> <laughs> uh, could have worked. With him, <laughs> and what was he like to talk to? Was he not? What was it he was. Like? It was great. It was quite direct. You know, it it, it, it didn't. It, there were so many people wanting to just say hello to him. It was, but he was very polite and. Uh, what do you mean by direct then? Well, he just said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> and then we moved on. It was, you know, there was not, not much uh, small chat in between. Now, we, 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 people talk about, for example, the theory of everything. Well, I suppose you could argue that, that, that Maxwell's bringing together electricity and magnetism was the first step on that. And the second step was Weinberg bringing uh, electromagnetism and, and the weak force together to make electroweak theory. So you're now got building up these ideas to sort of bring all of physics together into a theory of everything, which is not completed yet. Hopefully, I think something like string theory would probably be a good candidate for, for achieving that. But it's kind of, you, you see what, 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 what Weinberg was starting to build there. The, really the passage towards the theory of everything, I would say. What should we think about these people dying? I mean, obviously, people get old and they die. Yeah. But like, what does it mean that some of these, you know, a lot of these really big names in physics are dying now? Yeah. Is that just like, does that mean anything? Or I think there, I think it's a sign that there's a whole generation of real superstars, and it's a, an interesting question: is that have we got, you know, people to replace them? I don't think we have at the moment. I mean, we've got some brilliant people, but they're not. There's one or two. I mean, there's the, there's the Wittens and maybe Maldacenas out there who, who have had a fantastic impact. But it's certainly the case that, you know, the likes of Feynman and Gelman and Hawking with Hawking evaporation and, and, and Weinberg, you know, with his model of, of the leptons, they were making predictions for things that you can go looking for. Of course, Hawking evaporation is very, <laughs> no one's seen that. But the, the idea of, you know, singularity theorems of Penrose and company. Um, I'm not sure we, we, we have that at the moment, right? The, the, the theoretical position we're in, it's, it's, it's got much more difficult. In many ways, the calculations that, that can be done ha have been done, and, and we're left with things trying to figure out where to go from there. I think the subject's in quite an interesting stage of, you know, where do we go from here? And that's one of the big debates that's going on. Should there be a new super collider, right, to, to go looking for the Higgs or go looking for supersymmetry. The things that have been put forward, we don't know what the dark matter is, we don't know what the dark energy is, we don't know whether supersymmetry is out there. We still don't understand why the, pa the particles have the masses that they've got. And we don't have any decent explanation for these, so I don't think we could say we have the people who have made those fundamental predictions like I would say Weinberg did and Feynman did. 
Are you jealous of people like Steven Weinberg? It's point being jealous. It's like being jealous of Messi. Right? You know, you just they're just they're just there, right? They're just they're just better. Right? You know, he's blessed and, and he's brilliant. And and you know I'm just glad that, that the world of physics has, has people like that because they help us advance so much. And also, and I think for those of us that, that sort of working, you know, these levels below, you know, they do give us these nuggets of ideas that we can play with. Okay, we're never going to do the wonderful things that they, that they did, but, but they give us these nuggets of ideas and, and they help us understand at least. Um, so yeah, no, the, the Wyomings of the world are wonderful. Back in 1973. So this is a big. This is this is a piece of history, is it? It really is a piece of history. This this the experiment that went on in this machine, actually won uh, Glashoff, Weinberg, and Salam the Nobel Prize in 1979. What happened in here? So they've got a lot to thank thank this machine for.